Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, past, present, and future. Welcome, and here now, Corey Gomez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, past, present, and future. Today, I am joined by a man who was in three amazing basketball films. I'm talking blue chips. I'm talking white men can't jump and the always popular slam dunk Ernest. I am here today with Mr. <laughs> Selk Kozart. How are you? Corey, I'm great, brother. How you doing, man? I liked Slam Dunk Ernest. That was almost as good as Ernest Goes to College. I'm telling you, I like Ernest. Man, I love Ernest. I, I, I loved um, Jim Varney way before I, I met him. I actually thought I would actually be in a movie with him, not you know, and it was just fun. You know, and, and, and a lot of people rec recognize me from that movie, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. I mean, white men can't jump, but they they remember Ernest, what? and I'm like, I love it. <laughs> Ernest kind of went down though, because you know, like at first, you know, he had the big movies. Then, then right after his, he was playing basketball, then it was like simple, like Ernest goes to college, yeah, uh, Ernest yeah. with shoes, Ernest goes right. to Africa. It was like, what the yeah. hell are they doing now? Yeah, Ernest scared stupid. Well, they're capitalizing on uh, the popularity, yeah, you know. Yeah. Who would have ever dreamed that a guy that advertised ice cream would go on to make <laughs> movies and have a Saturday morning TV show as the same ice cream selling character? I mean, that exactly. It, that's only I know an I would have, I, there. You know, and he was very, very talented. He could sing opera. He actually collected all kind of watches, and he brought them with him to Canada, where we shot the film. We were in Vancouver, and uh, he, he. I mean, my guy, he could. Uh, he was just so talented. I didn't realize he was that talented. He, when you see him, when he's not making the the earnest face, you don't even, you wouldn't even recognize. Him. No, he's like a normal. I've seen him in other things other than Ernest, but once you hear the voice, it's like, oh yeah, that's Ernest. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we played Uncle Jed in the Beverly Hillbillies on the remake of that. Yeah, he did great. I know. I know. He asked me if I wanted to go. Uh, Boar hunting with him. You go, see, okay, we're going boar hunting over Nashville. You, I pick you up, you know, in a helicopter, we can go on over. I was like, uh, nah, nah. that's all right. <laughs> that's boar? okay. Uh, that's all right, Jim. You go ahead. He asked me about 20 times to go boar hunting with him. I was like, man, I ain't going out in the woods with you, you crazy thing. No, but he was, he was a very nice man, very generous filmmaker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make sure people uh, were okay, you know. Not just the stars, but he took care of people like the extras. He made sure they ate what we ate. He didn't. It wasn't like the extras and then the stars. It was like everybody ate the same thing. He was very um, extremely di um, different than the, your average Hollywood star. You know what I mean? Well, how did you? I guess this is the the, the first question. How did you get started in acting? You know, I think like every kid in the world you know maybe 99 percent that you'd see something on television like i used to watch beverly Hillbillies. speaking of those uh, you know and things like uh, gilligan's island and just crazy shows and i just thought man they made me laugh and so i would do plays uh you know for the family or just one one act plays one and uh and then when somebody would laugh it just did something to me i felt like i i had something that i could really do and i didn't know until i got older that that's what i wanted to do so they wouldn't let me audition for, for plays in high school because uh, um it, where we were in the south and uh, if you didn't look if you weren't blonde haired blue eyed uh, you didn't get in the play yeah uh, yeah and so that's just what it was you know i mean my this just it was just that's just the way it was but you know things Things don't always stay the same. Yeah, it's the, way, it's the way it is here, you know. It ain't right. No. You know, especially you tell a child, you know, you're not, because nobody looks like you in the play, You can't, I'm, like, I'm thinking, I, and I knew it was wrong, you know, when the teacher was telling me, because I was thinking, what, what does that matter? I'm playing a character. I'm just, I just happen to look like this. I mean, who cares? I, I knew that was wrong. But I couldn't say anything or do anything, you know. And that was like, that was right in the 70s. You know, that was right, you know. Yeah. Right after Vietnam War stuff. And uh, Martin Luther King had just gotten killed. And 
it, it, you know, KKK had burned two two crosses in my yard because I went to a Jeez. dance. Yeah, and they hung hung my German Shepherd. And I'm oh. I'm a, I'm 12 years old. I'm 12 years old going to a little school dance, and um, and all that because I danced with other people, little girls and everybody. It's like what they call used to call a sock hop. Everybody just got out and just jam. Yeah, you know and. The next day, uh, or the next school day, I went out to, uh, you know, for the bus right outside my house, a little dry, at the end of the driveway. At the end of the driveway, there was a, a, a cross that had smoke coming off of it, and I didn't know what that meant. And then there was another one to the left of the house with smoke coming off of it. And I noticed the other thing, my dog was, King wasn't there, which always, always was right on the porch ready when I came out. Well, I came back in the house, I told her, my aunt frankie who raised me i said there's you know there's these things these the crosses out in the yard and the way she said what did you say i said look out the window there's there's two crosses i can't find king she goes oh my god the way she said oh my god yeah. scared me you know i'm like i'm 11 and a half to almost 12 years old going well what happened and then when my uncle came up he said what did you do where did you go and I said, I went to the dance. He goes, oh, my God. You done brought the clan on us. I was like, it's a clan. I was like, what the hell is a clan? Yeah. You know, but I didn't know anything. So um, it just scared me. And they and they made sure that those crosses stayed up. And I was like, wanting to take them down. And my aunt said, no, we're going to leave them up. And, then to this, and I used to think, why did she say that? And then she says, because I want to see who gets behind us and who does not get behind us in this neighborhood where we've been mm -hmm. and i thought that doesn't make any sense but then you know 11 12 years old of course it didn't make any sense and i didn't want to go to school because i i thought after they told me what the clan was oh well, yeah <laughs> uh, i was like well i'm not going and, sh and she goes yeah you're going i was like why why i'm gonna kill me I'm yeah what if they're there yeah yeah she she says well you know uh if you don't go now uh, we'll never be able to later. And I'm thinking, that makes absolutely no sense to me. But I'm again, I'm 11 years old, 12. And uh, so I went. And of course, you know, things were said and talked about. And, uh, you know, but anyway, those things like that, I think, help shape me or anybody that goes through whatever that is. Just like anything great positively you go through shapes you. You know, I think it's a combination of everything. And we can't, you can't, you can't take like somebody like a Mike Tyson and take away the dark side of Mike Tyson and just say, you're going to have Mike Tyson because you're not going to have the same Mike Tyson. He is the, all those things. We are all those things. Whatever, you know, we are those. We can't just say, okay, I'm only this. No, you're not. <laughs> but anyway. Did you, yeah, uh, <laughs> did you want to grow up and get revenge? Uh, you know, I did, but I wanted to do it through sports. I said, I'm going to be the best basketball player in the world. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you, you play and you work out and you do what you can do. And, and I thought if I'm the best player, they can't, they won't call me names. Cause that, that won't make sense. How can they call me names? If I'm scoring 30, 40 points a game uh, or, you know, I just, that was my way. And, uh, of course, it didn't work out that way, but at least that was what I planned. I planned to play college basketball, and then I wanted to become an actor, and then I wanted to become a director. That's what I wanted to do. I had it planned out as a 12, 13-year-old. So it didn't exactly happen that way, but uh, yeah, that was my way of getting away from everything is trying to be the best athlete I could, best football player. And, and football, my coach told me my freshman year in high school, said, uh, you know, I'm, my mom's Cherokee and my dad's black, right? And so, I, you know, I didn't look like all the other black folks they had been seeing in their life. So I come up there looking like I look, and they were like, son, ain't because I was a natural quarterback. And they were like, um, what are you doing in the quarterback line, boy? And I'm like, because uh, I'm quarterback, coach. I can throw and I can run. I, can, I know how to. They were like, get your butt out of here. You ain't, ain't no colored people got no brains to play quarterback. You're a wide receiver or a running back or a defense back. Something like that, boy. Yeah, get your butt out of here. Don't you bring that crap up to me again, quarterback. 
So he actually taught me that my freshman year. So, you know, you tell a kid that if a coach tells us, a, a kid that uh, they can probably believe that. And then the, the, that year, I'm at the University of Tennessee at this camp, all sports camp, and a guy named Gus Manning, God bless him, uh, was there in the in the in the dormitory, and he saw me play, you know, with the other kids, and he took me up to see a guy playing ping pong with all these huge guys around him. He was beating everybody, and and I, he said, "You're looking at our next quarterback." And I was like, the black guy? You know, like, he goes, uh, yeah, that's Connor Holloway. And I was like, the black guy. <laughs> He's going to be the quarterback of the University of Tennessee. He goes, yeah, son, what's wrong with you? Why, are you? why would you say, why would you question that? I told him about my coach, and he said, well, I think it's time to change schools or change coaches. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this, to this day, me and Con I met him that day, and – uh if freshmen could have played varsity, Conrad's would have started that year, his freshman year, but that was when freshmen couldn't play varsity. Uh, but the following year, I think they did. Uh, and that was me and Conrad have been friends ever since. <laughs> it's, and, and, you know, I just thought, man, I could have quit then, but I was like, Psh. I knew that was wrong, what he was saying to me. I knew exactly he just either hated me or he was ignorant or something. I just knew that was wrong. And then, like, I think, uh, Joe Gilliam, who was a, a black quarterback at one of the black schools. I'm thinking, aren't there black schools but black people play? And I mean, yeah. I'm thinking, what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> uh, colored people can't play quarterback. Boy, what's wrong with you? Get that out of your mind. And I had it out of my mind. And I didn't. I never got to play quarterback. I played running back. And the only time that I got to play quarterback, I threw a touchdown and ran for a no. So it was the last game of my senior year. So, you want to talk about frustrating? Well, I knew I could play college football very easy, but my heart was in basketball, you know, and then the coach didn't let me play my senior year after I grew up with all the guys in the same neighborhood, and we all were, we were pretty good together because we all knew each other so well by the time we were seniors. So, I, the coach said, no, I heard you're, uh, you've been, you know, dating these girls around here, and we don't, we don't. We don't have that here. We don't mix here. I, at first, and, and, and the, what's funny is I, I didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> I, it was just talk. I was like, I wish I had a girl. I was wishing I had that. But the only thing that uh, he was concerned with, uh, it would be a problem with the team. And they had a vote. And he said, if, any, if there's one player that does not want you to play on the team, then you're not playing. And I'm thinking, okay, let's have a vote. I mean, I grew up with these guys. You know, I'm thinking, nobody, who's going to not want me on the team? I'm like, I've, yeah. I knew everybody. everybody knew, and it was one person, <laughs> and it was a freshman that was going to, you know. Anyway, but the point was, I never knew that was the guy until years later. And then I see him, and he doesn't know that I know to this day. And I had to transfer to another school, another high school, in the middle of my senior year, after football season, to play on the team the school that we beat in football, <laughs> Loudon uh, High School, and they were in number one school in the, in the county that that year, and they hated me. <laughs> they saw me because we were the only team I think that beat them that year. And then right after football season, I transferred there to play basketball. They hated me. Oh my God, they hated me. I got to play the last thirteen games of my senior year basketball and, that, and then I, I said I don't care I'm not playing football in college I just want to play basketball I'll, I'll, I'll go anywhere podunk college I'll play wherever and then I started getting scholarship offers and I realized my coach had withheld a lot of the other schools that wanted me and I didn't know it I didn't know it you know that's when they actually had letters and you know <laughs> you know yeah. so anyway that, that, that hurt a lot and I carried that a lot but I Again, I put it in the sports and tried to just be the best ball player I could. You know, all these clan guys and this idiot coach and all grew up to, you know, fuck their sisters. You got to be on episode 227 with a young, hot Jack A. Jack so you, you A. You got the last laugh on all oh of them. Oh, my right God. <laughs> you know what, Corey? I don't even think about them anymore. Once I, I got the, once I got 
a taste of, you know, I got to try out with the Nuggets. You know, I fractured my foot, but I got to try out and I got to meet all these ball players that I just admire. You know, um, just, you know, Alex English, you know, is one of my friends who was at the Nuggets when I was, I mean, Michael Jordan's a friend of mine. I got to, Dominique Wilkins and I are great friends. All these iconic ball players I got to meet along the way of trying out in the, in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And when you don't make it, it's kind of, hey, I felt like, you know, just being on the court with these guys was like, that was enough for me. Not really enough, but it was, I can remember that and just remember what it's like just playing with Magic in the Summer League in L.A., mm -hmm. you know, at UCLA Men's Gym, where, you know, there's guys, these guys are diving on the floor like it was NBA Finals. That's the way they played then in the 80s. And I'm like, God, imagine you can get hurt, man. Why are you out here diving on the floor? He goes, because he might be a 12-year-old in the audience that ain't never seen me play. Well, yeah. I'm like, golly, that's like, <laughs> I love that, you know. So, yeah. So now I get to act, you know, and that's why why Man Can't Jump was so um, important to me because I would have paid them, <laughs> you know, to play. Oh, that, that was movie. a that was a incredible that came out. I was in uh, I just graduated high school when that came out, and yeah, that movie was a, wow. a pop culture phenomenon to say it's people still love it. Oh God, it was it it changed my life. But but um, but it's funny you said about two two seven because that was the first television series and the first job that I got. When I moved to LA, it was 227. It's a great and you know choice. who else? Yeah, and uh, Regina King was the daughter mm -hmm. in that show. She was like a teenager then, I think. And I was, I, I was in like 30, I think 28 or 27, 28. But that was the first gig playing uh, the bailiff, you know? <laughs> Well, shit, then you, just, got, you got to do uh, Amen with Sherman Helmsley. I mean, oh my God! Actually, that was actually the first thing I filmed, but the two two seven came out before I that one you. did. And Leela Rashawn and I got married on the show. I was a sailor that kept, that came in. Sherman Helmsley is one of the funniest guys on or off him. camera. I love that oh, guy. He was precious, man. He was and so nice. You know, the, the old school guys seem to be seem like they're just appreciative of every of just being being able to do what you do you know what i mean it was it was that first and yeah they enjoyed the, the fame and the money and all that but it was just they they made they made you feel comfortable on the set they knew i hadn't done anything before they knew i was nervous they knew all that but they made me feel like i was on the set every day like i'd been there every day and then therefore you get a better performance when you're comfortable like that how was uh, Julie Roberts? Julie Roberts is like that. Mel Gibson was like that when we did Conspiracy Theory. How it was, was just, Anna Marie? How was Anna Marie Horsford, the one that played uh, uh, Helmsley's daughter? I been, liked her on the Wayne's Brothers so much. Oh, you want to talk about funny? Okay, she's so close to the characters that she plays. The way she delivers things, really, the way she delivers lines. She tells jokes all the time. She keeps everybody in stitches. Oh my God, she is so so talented too. But just a sweet person you know what i mean mm -hmm. no. and I, I tend to remember the ones that are really talented and nice the ones that are talented and mean and jerks and assholes i tend to not remember too much about them <laughs> you know what i mean i gotta ask because you were on the episode of the fresh prince now i oh yeah I, did you ever think that will smith who, no offense mr smith if you should ever hear this you're right. one of the worst rappers ever, but I, and I love the Fresh Prince. The Fresh Prince was a, a right. great show. Did you ever think that in '93, watching him on the Fresh Prince, he'd go on to be a major, this big major Hollywood no. movie star? I Absolutely never, not. I never would have guessed it. I I would have never. And if somebody said, "Yeah, they're lying their ass off," I don't think. I mean, I'm sure Will probably might have seen that, but I don't think. I don't think anybody really could have foreseen that that magnitude the movies yeah i mean but not like the the force he's become or yeah. what it is and and he's just so smart he's a smart businessman um very sensitive guy very uh you know concerned 
But, you know, hey, <laughs> he's built his brand to be like, good gracious, you know. At, at one point, it was nothing he couldn't do, you know. He probably uh, still can if he wanted to. But I got to uh, have a nice scene with Tyra. And I always it's, liked the fact that James Avery was the voice of the Asian Shredder in the Ninja Turtle cartoons. I, absolutely. I always liked that. He always had to get Uncle Phil to play the evil oh. Asian in a cartoon back in the <laughs> 80s. I, I, that always brought me great, great pleasure because... You would always see all these Asian films and stuff where it was a white guy. It's like, all right, now I got a, now we got uh, Uncle Phil as the shredder. This is awesome. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> what a cool guy he was. Uh, everybody went to James Avery if they had an issue off set. If there was, I mean, seriously, if Karen Karen Parsons and I we dated, she was such a sweetheart. What a wonderful human being too. We're friends to this day. I'm friends with all all of them. I haven't seen Tatiana Ali in years uh but uh alfonso and i played on the same basketball team the hollywood knights uh uh and you know and sometimes will would come and play but alfonso played quite a bit and uh but karen and i ended up you know dating pretty serious <laughs> uh for a while but just the whole group was really cool if there was a problem they would actually call james like a real like james was the level head of all of them Everybody, I mean, I got it, you know, and and he had this great voice. You know, he sounded like, you know, he's like this. Well, he come from Broadway, so I mean, you know, he's like real deal. <laughs> you know, he could reach that person in the thousandth row in the back without a mic. You know, he was so talented. Well, I I always liked Karen Parsons, and she was in a movie with Kid and Play called Class Act. And I thought it might have been like one of her first actual movie roles, and I could not understand why she didn't keep going on more. She was naturally so funny; it was ridiculous. Yeah, very naturally funny. You know, she's one of the most, um, far as IQ and far as uh, scholastically speaking, in high school. She, she and Charlie Sheen, I think, went to the same school in Santa Monica High. I think it was, but um, she uh, was like in the top one percent in the country scholastically and which is ironic because she plays this ditzy you know yeah. <laughs> cousin on fresh prince but she's probably the smartest one in the room <laughs> you know and very practical very practical well in fact when we were while we were dating uh it was a show called lifestyles of the rich and famous mm -hmm. and they sent us to the bahamas uh to uh nasa or um yeah, the, anyway, so we were riding horses on the beach and all this stuff. It was, like, really romantic. So my, my, my days of, the, um, of that, uh, that, that time are pretty, pretty fond memories of everybody. What was it like uh, working on school days with uh, Spike Lee just starting and uh, a very uh, young Lawrence Fishburne? Oh, uh, yeah, it was, Larry, it was Larry then. That's, it was, oh. You didn't hear Lawrence until he's like, you know, Matrix guy. That's no, right, because uh, even in Deep Cover, it was still Larry Fishburne. That that's the right. the movie I think that, I really noticed him in. That was serious. Well, well you know, he was he was starred in Apocalypse Now with, with Brando. He was 14 when he did. They were in the Philippines for two and a half years. He told me, he says, Koza, I went over there a boy. And I came back a man. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's a horrible, uh, you know, uh, way. I, I'm trying to imitate his voice. I can't. He's a hardcore New Yorker. But uh, he, he was, uh, w let me tell you, Spike is a very smart filmmaker. Um, he, you know, he literally separated the dark skin and the light skin actors because he, I mean, these some of these hadn't acted before. Some were first time. Some maybe just done a little bit. Most were dancers from New York, where he's from. A few was from L.A. But if you were the in the dark skin category, you were called the Jigaboo. <laughs> oh, that's great. In the movie and and in real life, they you know people do that talk. They used to say that it used to be a word. Yeah. And if you were a light skin and have what they call good hair, you know. It'd be like, say, um, they, then they call you a wannabe, like you want to be white. You're trying to be white. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is all within the black community. And and actually, you know, the NCAA and, and 
all kind of people, when they found out we were doing this movie, they tried to get on Spike. They, they were saying, man, why are you washing dirty laundry and telling the world about how black folks really are? So he goes, man, shut up. <laughs> get yeah, out of my face. He's making a I'm movie. Telling a story. I mean, he's a brilliant filmmaker. And I learned a lot with Spike. Um, he would actually turn his back to the first rehearsal and you, you know, you think you're watching. He, he wouldn't even watch. He'd close his eyes and he would just listen to the scene. And I thought, the hell's he doing? He can't even. He would say, "All right, Larry, I can't understand what you're saying. You need to da da da." da. Silk, what are you doing? I, you know, I need you to do this or whatever. Or, or Tisha, I like that. Keep doing exactly what. So he would like. He had different ways he would direct. Like Ron Shelton has different ways he direct. You know, Richard Donner super, directed Superman. <laughs> you know, he directed the real Superman with Marlon Brando. Thank you, the real Superman. That new thing. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. And, you know, uh, and, and Dean Kane is a friend of mine. And he knows what I, what I mean when I say the real Superman. Because he, he and Christopher. Oh, Dean uh, Kane was were, great. It was good friends. Yeah, I thought so too. Well, Dean's a brilliant, brilliant guy. Anyway, but, but Richard Donner, I mean, what a great director. I mean, he told me that they paid Brando $1 million for one day to film. Because he had just won the Academy Award for Godfather. Hell yeah, that's... And can you imagine winning the Academy Award for The Godfather, right? And then you get a call from the studio, and they're like, um, we want you to, because there wasn't no Superman books, movies turned into books, really, at that time. In the 1979, I think, or 1980, yeah, somewhere around yeah, there. there was nothing, just that old show no. back in, like, the 50s. So, can you imagine, you're the considered the greatest actor in the world. That's, that's what, that's what, uh... He was. They were that Brando was considered yeah. the greatest actor in the world. He was considered that. And so you get a call from your agent. Um, they want you to play Superman's father. Yeah. You're like, what? You go, you know, you know, you mean from the comic books? <laughs> Not a fucking comic book character. You know? Can you imagine what he said? But he said no, like three times. And this is Richard Donner telling me the story. And I said, really? He said, I said, what'd you do? He said, we offered him a million dollars. And uh, and uh, we thought he, you know, and he said, yes. <laughs> and wow. so one day of filming, when nobody ever, I don't think anybody's done that since, but that was in 1979, 80 or something around there. Now the a million thing, dollars for one day filming. And now people are begging to be in superhero movies. How the times have yeah, changed yeah, exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. I wish I had that problem. What was you know, it? oh, well, I don't think I want to do a super, superhero today. Are you kidding me? What was it like being in Ricochet with uh, Denzel and uh, as Ice well, T's, I think, second film was off? Yeah. Well, it's funny because Denzel's the reason that I got White Men Can't Jump. Okay. But that's another, I'll tell you about that. But here's what we were playing basketball. Every weekend we played Fairfax High School. So one day, uh, you know, me and Denzel sitting right down, just waiting on the next game to play. And he goes, um, you know, I'm getting ready to do this this movie uh, called Ricochet. He says, it, you know, you might want to come and play. <laughs> you know, I said, as long as we get to play together, I'm, I'm there. You know, I don't, I'll carry water, you know, whatever, you know. And uh, he said, no, nah, we'll, fi we'll find something for you. I said, cool. So I just I show up on the set. He has a trailer, a huge trailer for me as a dresser. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even, it didn't matter. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the film. And. So I get this, the script, and it, you know, it says, oh, reporter, I'm, 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 you know, reporting about Denzel, about what just happened. So I got, to, that was kind of cool. Well, he comes in my trailer the first day, and he sits down, we're eating lunch, and he says, a script came through the pipe called White Man Can't Jump. I was like, what? <laughs> he, he said, yeah. He says, it's a comedy. And I said, I hope so. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but the writer, director is brilliant. He wrote and directed Bull Durham. I said, oh, man, yeah, that's the best. That's probably the best baseball movie in the world. It might be the best. That's actually the best sports movie in the world I've ever seen, realistically. He goes, yeah. And he said, well, uh, they wrote it for me, but I'm getting ready to play Malcolm X. And I was like, you can play Malcolm X. <laughs> so, like, golly, all this stuff was happening. He goes, yeah. He says, I ain't doing white men can't do anything. <laughs> I was like, I said, I, I, I understand. I got you. And so he said, but you, you, boy. It's perfect for you. I said, the lead role? He goes, yeah. He said, the lead role? He says, just, he's, 
He talks shit. He's he's a NBA type ball player. He plays on the street and he just bets, goes around betting. That's all he told me. He said, I got the script sent to your apartment. I said, they actually are put in a, send in a script to me. I don't have to go get it. <laughs> he goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said oh, yeah i said oh, i've never had that before i've never i always had to go get it or you know yeah anyway he said yeah so i read the script and i thought wow this is like it, it, it's like heaven i mean the, it's starting well denzel washington has told the director about me i'm getting ready to go meet the director the next day or whenever i show up to the audition and Ron Shelton sitting behind the desk and a, a bunch of like 10 uh, Warner Brothers executives, I mean, 20th Century Fox executives are sitting there all in suits. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, everybody, everybody. And I look at Ron and I go, wait a minute, you know, did you play basketball at the Hollywood Y in the, in the basketball league? He goes, yep. I said, this guy can play. <laughs> then I'm, I'm like talking about him, right? To the executive team they're all laughing and um it, it, i didn't realize he was the same guy i'd been playing ball against for a year and everybody just knew him as ron mm -hmm. and he was like in his 40s i think then he was like 40 something but he played like you know havlicek or you know rick barry i mean he could score he could play defense he was diving on the floor in fact he played the last game the championship game was between his team and my team like the year before I auditioned for him and he had a, he played with a broken hand played with a cast on. I was like, this guy's hardcore. Yeah. You know, he wrote, no, not, so I saw up and I said, you wrote bull to him and you directed bull. He goes, yep. I had no idea. I had no idea. So I auditioned. He said, he said to the whole, everybody in the room, he said, I, I already know he could play. I don't need to see him play, but we're going to set you up with some other, other actors coming in. I was like, okay. I had no idea that I was in first position. They had me in first position. So they had, the next day, they had Tom Cruise come to read with me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, like for the Woody part? Think, yeah. Oh, that Woody wasn't work. even thought about at that point. Never Woody wasn't even worked. thought, Woody wasn't even thought about at that point. So Tom Cruise was the first. I didn't know that Denzel and him had been talking. You know, he said, you're not going to find anybody. He said, you're not going to find anybody to play this role. They can play the game, do all the moves without tricks. Silk can do all that. Can act his butt off. Da, 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 da. So Ron read me first day with Tom Cruise. <laughs> you know, he had never seen me act. He'd seen me play ball, right? Mm -hmm. So my first audition was with Tom Cruise and uh, Top Gun was out. It was the number one movie in the world. You yeah. know, he made a billion dollars or something back at that point. And um, I'm thinking, Wow. And I'm thinking, damn, I hope he can play ball, you know? <laughs> and so we act, and I throw the script away, and, you know, we do a little ad lib thing. It's kind of cool. And then Ron goes, okay, let's go outside. So they had a court right outside where everybody auditioned. So <laughs> me and Tom just shooting around, and, and he gets the ball, and he goes, uh, I really can't play <laughs> that well. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm like, damn, it's a little late now. Yeah, you know, I got to try. Thinking, I'm thinking it's a little late now. I and mean, then, you know, I didn't even want to block a shot or any. I, I felt bad for him. But, I mean, I don't know why I did, but I did because he couldn't play that well, you know, to play that character. He, plus, he plus was he's athletic, but he, he wasn't a basketball player. And it was very obvious. So uh, he leaves. The next day, Keanu Reeves comes in to read with me. Okay, that could have been speed. really good. And speed. <laughs> it was just like the, probably the one or two or a second best number one movie at that time. It was like the biggest stars in the world. It was like, and I'm thinking, well, they're reading with me. And there's nobody else. I'm thinking, and Denzel was calling me, it's yours, baby. You know you got this. You know you got this, baby. This is you. Ain't nobody got <laughs> Nobody can. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah, Keanu comes in and he can't play hardly at all. In fact, he almost hit me in the head going up for layup just. <laughs> just in the layup line, you know? And uh, so uh, Keanu leaves, and, and Ron Shelton, he says, look, he says, I I don't know what these guys are doing playing, growing up, but they sure wasn't playing basketball. But anyway, <laughs> he says, I'm going to, he says, the studio's not going to let me use you unless I have a big white 
name. He said, so I'm going to Chicago, and I'm meeting with John Cusack. He can open the movie, and I can use you then. I was like, cool, and I'm praying, John, please be able to play. Please be able to shoot a jumper or something, mm -hmm. you know. He goes up, and, he, and Ron calls me when he comes back, and he says, he takes me to lunch, and he says, <sighs> Cusack and I had a good meeting, he said, but we went across the street from where we were having lunch, and just to shoot around, and... uh it's not gonna work out. <laughs> I was like, golly. And I said, So what are we gonna do? <laughs> what are we yeah. gonna do? He goes, Well, we <laughs> now he says, um, we're gonna have, we're gonna go with the guy by the name of Wesley Snipes. And I was like, Who's that? He goes, They did a movie called um New Jack City and um that it's making a lot of money for the studio, which was Fox. One of and the greatest movies ever. It was absolutely. Had. And he said, um, that's who uh, they're pushing. But he said, I, I don't know. He says, I, I, I don't want to lose the film. He says, uh, Joe Roth, who was running the studio at the time, he says, Joe's, uh, Joe's going to, you know, he says, we can't go with, with you at the, as a lead. He says, find something else. He said, unless you get a big name and nobody's come up. Well, Woody and I, audition that evening he ron calls me in and he says okay um this next one i want you to have some fun with throw the script away toward the end and just see how you can go off book because he's a television guy i want to see him see how he can like you know ad lib and stuff i was like okay i didn't know woody harrelson was walking in the door i was just standing you know in, the, in waiting on who, next thing woody comes in and it was like hey I was like, hey, what? You know, I was like, oh, I felt like I already knew him because, you know, I was already a fan, you know, for years. And, and he was so cool. And we just hit it off. And uh, toward the end of the audition, I, I threw the script down and started ad-libbing stuff. Like, man, who do you think you are? You know, white man can't jump. You know, I started ad-libbing stuff. And he threw his script down. And he started ad-libbing stuff. He goes, well, black man can't swim. So what? <laughs> I mean, he was just. I mean, he would make up. I mean, it was so funny. And the hardest thing to do was not to laugh. It's to stay in character. And Ron let it go for, I mean, we were going back and forth, mama jokes, all the kind of stuff. And it was just so perfect. And I'm thinking, so I leave the audition, right? Thinking, I just, I mean, it's going to be me and Woody. It's me and Woody. And that night, New Jack City came out, right? So it was only playing in uh, one theater in Pasadena. Yeah, we so only me had and it. my roommate drive to Pasadena to see this movie that Wesley Snipes, this guy, and, you know, he did the uh, Beat It uh, video with Michael Jackson. He's mm -hmm. the dancer, Wesley. He's a great, great dancer as well. But anyway, we're watching the movie because there's a basketball scene in, in it. And uh, we're watching it, and I went, oh, he's not a basketball player. This is great. You know what I mean? He's a, He obviously is a great athlete, but I see he's not a basketball player. Denzel's calling me. This is yours, baby. You know it's yours. You know you got this. You know this is yours. You know I'm breaking. Wow. Me and Woody. Next thing I know, I get a call from my agent. He says, it's not going to work out. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, Fox can't go with two, basically. Well, got one television, fifth, fifth star in a television show, and a no-name of the league. They're not going to put $25, $30 million into that yeah and i was like okay so ron calls me and he tells me he takes me to dinner he tells me everything he says but i'm gonna rewrite the script i'm gonna make you a character and you can't be edited out of the movie every time we see you we see the star the two leads you're the third or fourth he said i'll make sure you make the money that you would have made if you were the star of the film and you're gonna be in all the ads all the things he said i'll make sure of that myself he said this is your film he said, "But we're gonna, we're gonna make other." He said, "We're gonna make other movies together." Mm -hmm. And I and I went, "Man, you're the best thing. You're the unbelievable human being." And we've made three other movies since then. Because Blue Chips, he wrote, he didn't direct it, but he wrote it, you know, and played to the bone with Woody and Antonio Banderas. So he, Ron Shelton is like, I, I can't tell you how much I love that man, um, just for being a friend, and a, and I've learned a lot from him as a director, you know. Because that's what I want, you know, it's what I'm doing now. So, anyway, I know I went around the corner to get across the street, but I thought 
it, it did um, kind of let you know a little bit about white men can't jump and how important that was to me in my career. Because it kind of after that, it just uh, everything took off. You know, I was in the studio system. You know, uh, you get to travel all over the world. People in Africa recognize you. Like you, you recognize me. You go, oh yeah, go back to Sea World. <laughs> I'm a, I was amazed at different countries how they knew the lines and everything. So, you know, anyway, that that, that film just it, it totally made my career. No question about it. The one no question. Thing. It really shows you what a good actor Woody is because he played that hayseed on Cheers. I mean, he was, a, he was a step below a hayseed in White Men Can't Jump. And then Absolutely. he's Larry Flint. He's uh, uh, Zombie Land. You know, he can hey. play all these parts and he's so good at them. Natural he Born is Killers. Absolutely phenomenal, awesome actor. He could do anything. And he was, he's actually. So, I mean, everything he does is like he puts everything into it. It's all about what he's doing at that moment. It's like, the mo you ask him what the most important thing is, like, what, I'm, what am I working on right now? <laughs> you know? Because what's done is done, you know? What was Wesley like? You hear mixed. Um, Wesley is a, is a very um, pure individual that, wears his personality on his sleeve when he when he chooses to show you that you know what i mean it's very honest he's not a liar he's not a he's like straight up he, he's real hard but he's also a soft you got depending on he's very i like his honesty and um unbelievable actor uh he's one of the best actors in the world no question about it he could do anything he, he could do anything so you know you realize you got to do Ricochet with Ice-T, and Ice-T was in uh, New Jack City with Wesley Snipes, who you were in with White Man Can't Jump. You have an Ice-T connection going on there. Oh, love Ice-T. I haven't been around him a lot, but every time I've been around him, we talk, we say that about, wait a minute, that's the connection, you know? <laughs> I'm a huge, huge, like, I'm not a big rap guy, but I loved Ice-T. I, I think Ice-T's a great actor. I, uh, I want to interview Ice-T so bad just so I can say, Ice, you've been on Law & Order for 15 years, and every time there's a murder, you always go, I can't believe that. It's like, how, you're the worst detective ever because you see this shit every day. You, you never believe what happens. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's funny. But you, you know what? While, when we finished... We had just finished White Men Can't Jump. But we needed maybe one little... We just really finished. We were just doing post-production. And then the Rodney King thing happened. Yeah. And L.A. was shut down. We we couldn't release the film. That that film had to stay for a, I don't know how long before we could release it. Right during all that, that stuff. Because that was the biggest story in the country. I mean, can you believe that? I, having that movie in the can for yeah. weeks or months and you're like <laughs> golly <laughs> yeah because generally when a movie goes in the can it's because it's shit not because of you know violence somewhere you know that's uh right yeah, that's very weird in the can i mean i just meant that means like it's done finished uh that's a term in movies <laughs> oh, that yeah, i've no, heard You'll see some, my friend will be like, hey, you know, like like when that New Mutants movie came out. You anxious for New Mutants? I was like, well, they filmed it three years ago and it's been in a can on the shelf. No, I'm not anxious for it. There's a reason <laughs> yeah. when things get delayed three years. Come on. There's a reason. <laughs> yep. There's a reason. But that was that was scary times. Oh, yeah. That was a little scary. All the riots and... <laughs> yeah, that was, that was scary times. What was... Because uh, you did Blue Chips with Nick Nolte and... Uh, Shaq. Shaq. What, what, Shaq's first film. What is, yep. what is you know, I love Shaq. I, I'm, I, I do too. On and off basketball, I mean, of course, he was Shaq, but I love Shaq. I watch He's Shaq when kid. he does Shark Week. I mean, is he a funny oh. guy? Oh, 24-7. You got you to gotta stop. You'll laugh so much. He's so naturally funny, and you, you don't even realize he's a giant. You know, he, he just blends in. You wouldn't believe it until you realize he's a giant. We were filming in... Uh, uh, Indiana, 
that at that state at that arena that's a huge big around arena where you know all the college games were mm -hmm. the scene and um Shaq wasn't uh old enough to get in the clubs clubs right so uh nobody thought about it so me and Shaq became friends and another guy his friend named Dennis that he played ball with at LSU um we went got a car and went to uh Went to this club you're supposed to be jumping, right? We get there, and there's a line. So the guy said, oh, man, you can just go up to the front, man. So we go up to the front, <laughs> and the doorman goes, uh, Shaq, I, I can't let you in, man. I mean, there's like 100 people in the line, right? Everybody's like, can I get you 100? Can I get and he's like, what? What you talking about? He says, Shaq, <laughs> we, we all know. We all know you're not old enough to. He said, I can lose my job. He said, and, and then. I think I said, or Dennis or somebody said, are you serious, dude? I mean, I'm sure everybody here is not 18 or something there, or whatever, yeah. not 21. And he goes, man, I can't. I'm sorry, man. And Shaq, this is so, so cool. Shaq, we started to walk away. And Shaq turns around to the guy and says, okay, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fuck the paces up on the first time I play. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the first game, the next game, with, you know, because he played with Orlando. Yeah. Magic. So... The first game, I think he scored like 38 points, had like 100 rebounds and about all this block shots. He killed me. And, and <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. I mean, he just turned real quiet and says, okay, well, I'm going to fucking pace this up when I come up. I was like, damn. <laughs> you know? He's, you know, I, I don't have a good week until I at least get to hear him go, four rings, Chuck. You know, I, I, yeah, that, that I makes know, people... I know. Oh, I know that's so funny. My son's favorite YouTube. My son, he's eleven. He's you know, of course, YouTube guy. His yeah. favorite YouTube video out of all of them is when Shaq eats the the one chip challenge, oh. and and he's just like it's nothing to me. And then all at once, <gasps> like that. I mean, like Shaq's like one of his. Cause he's always like, Dad, when are you gonna interview Shaq? I was like. Well, Shaq and I don't really uh, know each other very well. So, hey, you never know. It's, it's you like never the, know. The odds of this happening, son, don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean he's a monster, though. I mean, I, I, I mean he's he's way bigger than any basketball player I've ever seen. Oh, he's a he is a monster, and you know what got me is like you know, and I'm I was in pretty decent shape when we were doing blue chips, so I was playing, you know, I was playing ball in the summer pro leagues and stuff, and everything just you know and competing and so i'm thinking man i can't wait to get that when we went to um to film in new orleans uh you know we got to play a lot so in between you know days that we wasn't filming we'd be you know rick fox you know bobby harley like some of the best ball players in the country were there you know uh the guy who played ricky Rowe. i mean he was a, he was a ball player from europe i mean so a lot of these guys were like pros and so the first day I ever played against Shaq, I'm thinking, you know, I was throwing the ball off the backboard and dunking it, just showing I could jump and all that stuff. He's like, all right, you bring this shit in here. You ain't going to do that no more. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, you know, just playing with me, you know, just joking. I'm like, not going to really do that, you know. Well, I got, <laughs> I, I see a clearance, right, and I go, and I'm just going to throw it off the glass and try to catch it before he gets to me. <laughs> he went up. All of a sudden, the whole rack disappeared all i saw was a chest <laughs> up there i mean it was like he covers so much space and i'm thinking you could shoot a shot on the side of the lane but he could get to you before the ball gets to the hoop. i didn't i'd never played against somebody like that you literally i mean i don't see how any big man could stop him if he really wanted to play i i, I don't i just don't see it no, I mean he was he was ma I mean it was massive. I mean it was just I mean, seven I mean, one three. He was about three twenty, and he was lean when we did blue chips. He wasn't he wasn't happy because he was right out of college, you know. I remember they brought him into WWF wrestling years ago, and he was bigger than half those guys. <laughs> I know. And he's just standing there towering over all of them. It's scary. Hey, the first day we went to breakfast. Where we were staying at the hotel in New Orleans, right? And Nick Nolte was there. Um, we go to this, like, all you can eat thing or whatever. Um, the first day. Second day, we go to breakfast at another place. Shaq's order, he orders a dozen eggs, scramble, a dozen scrambled eggs, and a loaf of bread. Jesus. And, uh, yeah, I, 
and a gallon of uh, or a half a gallon of cranberry juice. And <laughs> and uh, I thought when the eggs came, I thought it was like a, you know, we all were gonna grab, you know, some eggs. Yeah. And I started. He goes, Hey man, what you doing? I was like, <laughs> Getting some eggs. He goes, You ain't getting my eggs. I said, Right. And it was in like a big server's plate. That was his plate. I thought he was joking. He ate all that. It was no big deal. Jeez. It was no big deal. I, I never experienced that. And you know, you know, when the cell phones were big, um, he couldn't use because his whole his one finger covers the whole phone. Well, yeah. So he could never punch. He could never punch the numbers. He's so. I said, you need to get an iPad to be your <laughs> cell phone. Well, that's a good idea. So <laughs> he, had a, he carried a, a, an iPad around for, for like when it first came out. It was like his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you mean? What do you think's the better movie, Blue Chips or Steel? <laughs> I think uh, for children, Steel. <laughs> well, <laughs> for anybody over five, uh, the latter. Blue yeah. Chips. Now, does he really know Kung Fu? Uh he's yeah. Actually, he has trained. Oh, he holy actually, God! He trained, and I think the. Uh, Snakes style of you know there's snakes yeah. there's praying mantis mm -hmm. so I think he praying mantis or snakes one or the other. Okay, could you imagine if 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 he were young, say he was younger and he didn't get into basketball, if he went into MMA, how oh, could you shit. how could you you couldn't stop him? You would have to you would have to take him chop him up. You'd have to get to his legs really quick and just take him down that way. But you it, but as soon as you get hit, it's over. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be the case of you'd hear the let's get it on and the towel from the corner would be falling in the <laughs> ring. I mean, yeah, exactly. Hey, I don't know. I mean, I don't. There would be, really be no way. But you know what? I did a movie called uh, Reggie's Prayer with Reggie White, right? Mm -hmm. And Paul Paul White, the giant. Yeah. I had never. It was before he was really big, right? I mean, before he's well known. He was like 23 or something like that. And he's seven, five. Uh, 500 pounds or something like that and I had never seen a man that big that you know that was way before blue chips and all that before Shaq so we're in the middle of shooting and we're at a, we're in Portland Oregon filming because that's where Reggie White had his deal with with the the owner of the Portland baseball team they had a film company so he wanted to do a movie about how you know Reg, how Reggie quits playing football at the height of his career uh, and goes to a little small town in Knoxville uh, and helps one kid. If he if he helps one kid, he feels like he, his purpose, you know, was there or whatever. That was the premise, Reggie's prayer. And then after that, he quits. I mean, he he leaves and he goes back to pro football and he wins a wins a Super Bowl. That was that was the the film. And he actually after we filmed, he actually went back and he actually won the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, but. While we were filming, uh, Paul, the giant, uh, we were filming a scene. Where he literally picks up Reggie White, who's 6'7", 330 pounds. Mm -hmm. He picked him up like he was a, a pillow over his head. And Reggie said, hey, man, put me down. Man, ain't nobody ever handled me like this. He was scared. And, and I was like, I had never seen that before. And then we go play basketball. We're in the gym. You know, we break for lunch. And there's a basketball court there. Natural, you know, we got. I, I got to shoot around. Paul, the giant, comes out there. Not only can he shoot, he was dribbling behind his back, hailing a fast break at seven foot four, seven five, five hundred pounds. Could play like that? I said, "Wait a minute, how are you not playing in the NBA?" And you're, he goes, he taps his shoulder, his chest. He goes, "My heart." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Doctors wouldn't let me play basketball or football or anything because." I could have a heart attack and die because of my, I have a condition. I'm like, I just saw Pete Maravich at 7'5", 500 pounds. What are you instead, talking about? Instead he said, I could only do that wrestling. for like, <laughs> he said, all the thing I could do for maybe 30 seconds or a minute, and then I would have to sit down. He said, I wouldn't be able to play in a real game. Mm, yeah. I was like, oh my God. I couldn't believe, I was like, I never, yeah, I never experienced that before, you know? Well, the scary anyway. the scary thing is, I got to meet him backstage at a wrestling show, and I mean, he I mean, he was huge. But then, 
when they brought Shaq in to do the face-off with him, I'm looking, I'm like, my God, the giant looks like a child next to this man, you know, but I, it, it, it was scary. Except, did you see his hands? Yes. His, his fingers are about they the size of my head. His thumb is about the size of my wrist. Yeah, I mean, he, he and he was a real nice guy. I mean, I always met him for a few minutes, but nice, polite. He signed something for me. So, but yeah, then when yeah. I saw him with Shaq, I was like, good God, how big is this man? <laughs> hey, Shaq will make the whole gold disappear if he just goes up in front of it. No, no, the one with uh, MC Hammer was in Reggie's prayer too, wasn't he? Yeah, and you know what? He the, the only reason he was there because uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Okay. He 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 was supposed to play uh, the role that I end up playing, and uh, he mysteriously left the, the the set the day before we were shooting, and Reggie and Sarah, his wife, came to me and said. Malcolm left. I said, what do you mean he left? He said, He's, he went back to L.A.? I said, what do you mean he went back to L.A.? We're we'll shooting tomorrow. He goes, and he took our, and he's, you know, we paid him. I said, what do you mean you paid him? I mean, he said, I'd be stopping that check. I said, well, yeah, but they, they, they got um, up early, and, you know, uh, Malcolm and Eddie, I think, was out at that point. So, well, I remember they that all, show. you know, plus he was on the Cosby show. Everybody knew him. He was very famous. So, I think they got the president of the bank to come in and he cashed a check that morning and flew back to L.A. That's fucked up. And yeah, it is. And so I haven't seen. I, I saw him since when Michael Jordan put his uh, company. Uh, he got behind a, a, a music company in L.A. And uh, Malcolm was at the at the uh, the beginning of that, the opening. And uh, but there was you know cameras there. I couldn't. I looked at him like, uh huh. I, I know what you did. <laughs> anyway, so Reggie was freaking out. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I said, Look, Reggie. I said. Let me figure out. I'll call somebody. He said, "Well, who can we call for?" I said, "We might have to postpone it for like one more day to give us, you know." I said, "I'll take the role that Malcolm was going to play. I'll I'll just do that that role, and I'll get somebody to play the other role, the one that I was going to play, which was the Forest Ranger, the Ranger." Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Who are you going to?" So I remember <laughs> Stanley <laughs> Hammer, and I said, "I knew he was going through some things financially at that time." Suge Knight and all this stuff. He had just lost his mansion, like a twenty million dollar place or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I knew, you know, hey, fifty grand or whatever it is would, would help right now, you know. Yeah. So I called him up and I said, I said, Hammer, I said, Hey man, I'm doing this movie with Reggie White. Oh, I love Reggie White. I love Reggie White. <laughs> I said, Well, I said, I'm doing it. We grew up together here in Knoxville. I said, But we're in Portland. And I said, What? Would you, how about coming over and let's play, man? It's like one of the roles. He said, oh, so, I don't know. I said, I got X amount of dollars. He goes, what time's the flight leave? <laughs> you know? <laughs> he was there, man. We picked him up and, you know, worked it out. And that's what happened. I, I hate to say that in a negative way about Malcolm, but that wasn't cool what he did. No. And I'm, I'm sure um, and Reggie wanted to sue him. I don't know if he did or not, but I was like, I just got, you know, it made me angry. But, um, you know. I'm thinking, man, you're multi-millionaire. Why would you, you know, take, you know, a hundred grand or whatever it was from yeah. a little, little one point five million dollar production? You know, I'm like, why would you do that? You know, he's like, they shouldn't have paid me early. I'm like, damn, Jesus. I know, and then but see, Pat Morita was in that movie. He was in, you know, the Karate Kid. Yeah, and That's Reggie reality. called me, and Reggie said, uh, Silk. He said, uh, Pat Morita. Uh, said, if, if you're doing it, he's doing it. I said, Pat, Karate Kid, Pat Morita? He goes, yeah. I said, I, I never met Pat Morita. He goes, well, he said, if you do it, he's going to do it. I was like, I'm doing it. What do you mean? You know? And he, Pat Morita was the nicest guy. He, he, you'd think he's going to talk like Mr. Miyagi, like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. that stupid stereotypical thing that people have with, with Asians, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like this. When I saw him, he gave me a pound. Like, yo, what's up, my man? <laughs> I was like, hey! He was like just down to earth. And he was like 70 probably then, or maybe a little older, and his wife was like 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you, you go. Know? I was like, I want, when I grow up, I want to be like you. <laughs> it's, all that, it's all that Miyagi dough, you know, that got him. But yeah. No, I... <laughs> yeah, hey, man. She loved him, though. What she really loved him. Oh, he's a she, hell of an actor. Yeah, and a, a hell of an actor, man. 
I mean, he was doing stuff. I think he was doing stuff back when Bruce Lee was uh, around, I think, right? Yeah, yeah he'd been around a long time. And then, hell, he was Arnold on Happy Days. That's right. Oh, my God, that's right. Wow. Wow. What was the... Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say the... Um, um, Opie, oh, <laughs> who uh, would have thought yeah. he became one of the best directors, one of the hottest directors in the in the industry? Yeah, I mean, you, you don't know. I mean, the only person I always said, and, and I will take pride in saying this, that when I first saw a movie, I was like, if this guy does it, he's going to be a huge star. That was The Rock. Oh, absolutely. I think, I can't wait. I'm going to meet him. I know we're going to meet one day because I've met so many people. Uh, it'd be a couple of stars, they would say, man, I met Dwayne, and he reminds me of you so much. You guys have the same kind of... I was like, what? They said, yeah, your energy, kind of the way we treat people and talk to people and say he's real polite, very family-oriented, and loved his dad, you know, all this stuff. And uh, then I see him on interviews, and I'm like, wow, man, he's like, I feel like I know him, you know, and I feel like we're going to make a movie, and one day we're going to do something together. And, then, you know, you never know with, with that. I'd never in my life seen a wrestler... With just a a look, capture yeah. a, 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 you know, and not capture a, a crowd of a hundred people, but you know, sixty, seventy thousand people, and he could have them with just a, a turn of a head, turn around, and and it was, and then when he did the Scorpion King, it was like this this guy oh. could be if he separates from wrestling, he'll be one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Sure enough, he is the biggest star in yeah. Hollywood. And you know what? And it's not just because of his size and all that stuff, and what he looks. It's because of his energy he exudes, his personality, what he is. And I think he's he's very humble. What I've gathered, yeah. And uh, when pe when people are humble, man, you you, you know people want to be around you. Then if you're not humble, they don't care what you look like, and they don't care. They don't care how much money, how fa famous you are. You're you're an asshole. You're an asshole. You know. Every every day, I randomly try to catch him on Twitter and go, "Hey, how about an interview for the site?" You know, hoping one day he'll see it and catch it because he I got might this do it. I mean, if he would be the guy that it. would do it. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy, he, genuinely nice guy. He, he sure seems that way. I, I I think I don't know. Every time I've thought about, I might run into somebody. I actually run into them at some point. What was maybe years later? But I might be eighty years old. Yeah, we're gonna make a movie together, there, Rock. <laughs> what was Arnold like in Eraser? Oh, he was very funny. I didn't realize he was that humorous. Um, you know, and I had heard stories about him having a house here in Knoxville, where I'm from, because he married, you know, Marie Shriver, who's you know, a Kennedy, basically. And they had a store called Shriver's. It was a big, big store in, in the South. So everybody used to say, oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a house in Knoxville. I was like, Where? And nobody could ever tell me. So one day we're filming. Uh, me, I was in the makeup chair. He was in the makeup chair next to me. And we were just just sitting there talking. I said, Arnold, I said, uh, I heard you, you you come to Knoxville and you have a house out there. He goes, ah, oh, no, I love Knoxville, but I don't have a house there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, those lying sons of bitches in Knoxville, you know. And I, I couldn't wait to come back home and they call up people that said, oh, yeah, Arnold lives over there. And I was like, you lying. I just made a movie with it, so shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was he was very, very um, professional. And very he had the first Hummer I had ever seen, all black. And he drove it on the set at, at uh, Universal, where we were filming. And it's a black, and all the windows were black tinted. And you couldn't even see. And all of a sudden, he... Pulls up to my, um, where my dress room is, was, you know, the trailer there inside the studio where you're filming. And I was like, everybody was looking at this thing. And it was like the big one. It was like the one that's really wide, not the play one. Yeah, the actual military one. Yeah, it was the mil the one with the tires was as big as I am. And, you know, it was as wide as a big truck. It wasn't, and, it, and I said, what the hell is that? And then all of a sudden it pulled right in front of my dressing room and the window slowly rolled down and it was Arnold in the driver's seat. But he was way over there. And I, I, I looked in there and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> he goes, this is the new shit. This is the shit. You got to get one. <laughs> I said, are you crazy? I can't afford this. I don't make $20 million a movie, fool. You know, it, but he was like that. And then next thing you know, Stallone has one. And... Uh, because they were partners in in the um, you know the 
what he, the hotel um, slash you know memorabilia. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was, what was it called? Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, Planet Hollywood. And uh, they were, I mean, that group. That was a tight group that that made that. I was with um, with the guy that created that and uh, who brought it brought it to them actually, Brian Kessner. And he has a twin brother named Boyd Kessner, who's one of the stars of G.I. Jane. Uh, but he and, uh, and uh, the Outsiders, uh, not the not the the old one, but the the a newer a newer one. But Boyd Kessner, a great actor, and Brian Kessner, he's a really good actor too. But he became more of a business guy, and um, he brought the idea um, to a, a film executive who produced a lot of Arnold's movies, and. They formed Planet Hollywood, and I was right there while they were doing it. I was like, "Wow, that's how this works," <laughs> you know. And I was like, "Good gracious!" They just got together and said, "Okay, yeah, we're gonna do." This. I got an idea. Oh, okay, well, I'm gonna do this like this, and have this. The hallways like this. When you want everywhere, you, they're all the same. And the, like a year later, it was like the biggest thing in the world. I was like, "Are you? That's how you do this?" So I got spoiled thinking that all business deals are just you call up your guy. He calls up his guy, and you go to the bank, and you make heat on you, and you do it. I wish it was that easy, but that, what an education, though, you know, being around those those types of business. And that's why, you know, sports and, and, and this business got me really, really uh, more so acclimated to the other side of the camera as I got older, because it, it became more of a business than ever, you know. Because I realize I'm not going to act forever. You know, I'd like to be 80 years old and still play somebody's grandma, granddaddy, you know, or something. Yeah. But uh, I, I, but I, I, working with the great directors like Ron Shelton, Richard Donner, Spike Lee, and Warren Beatty, I mean, all those guys, uh, you learn. And, they, they, and and Richard Donner let me direct a couple of scenes in Conspiracy Day. Ron Shelton let me direct a, a few scenes in Wyoming Kids. I mean, it just made me so honored just to be on the set i would get up every day and just watch where ron would put the cameras even if i wasn't in the scene i would just get up and watch how they set up and where where you put the microphones they would hide a microphone in a plant that was between two actors talking and you'd never see it hmm. you're like wow you know i mean little little things that you know make sense now as a filmmaker i'm like wow now i can put all those things i've learned now I can do that as a director now. And I, you know, you call these guys up and, they, you know, they get on the phone and they tell you, you know, you go over the scenes with them and you're like, wow, how how fortunate am I to, to have that, you know? Let me ask So I wanted you. to make sure I'm available to young filmmakers or, you know, or young actors, you know, I coach actors. I, you know, I teach here in, in Knoxville. I teach wherever, usually other cities, other actors will fly in for a couple of days and, We'll work on work on their scene, you know, kind of tighten them up and everything. That's really a high for me, you know. Now let me ask you because fifteen years ago you were in a movie. Let me backtrack a little bit. Uh-oh. In, in nineteen ninety one, the greatest biker movie in the history of biker movies came out. That movie was called Cool as Ice, starring Rob Van Winkle, <laughs> Vanilla Ice who I am actually a huge fan of. I met him. I, I, I seriously doubt he remembers me. Uh, in 2005, you made a movie with him called The Helix. It has been 15 years, and I have yet to see this fucking film, and, I, I, and I've and i wanted to see it for 15 years. Guess what? So have I. Oh, I what it happened? 15 years as well. Did it, like, I, did somebody I've lose never, the negative? I've never or? seen it. I've never seen it. I don't think it's ever been released. I would like to see it just just to laugh, to see how funny it is. It, you I mean, know, I, I played a I played a hundred and twenty year old man. It's a takeoff of the Matrix, only with a lot of weed, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why why do you think it never came out? I mean, clearly, the same reason. The same reason most movies don't. Uh, there's no money to market it. Uh-huh. Well, couldn't you market it enough with? I mean, Vanilla Ice is it? I mean, all these years later, he's still a name. I, I hey, you're preaching to the choir. But Why doesn't he buy it? I, he should. He's got the chips. He, when he, <laughs> he, 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 every time he shows a house, it could be playing on the TV. 
And you know, and, and the thing about it is, he's got millions of fans that would oh. want to see that. They don't care if it's a good movie or not. You know, when you got fans, they're your fans. I mean, I saw him in concert when he was the the rapper, you know, Ice Ice Baby. I saw him in concert when he was doing thrash metal. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I watch his reality show where he flips houses. I mean, I'd see yeah. it. I mean, so, so do a lot of people, you know. And he seems was he pretty? He seems like a really really cool guy, is he? Very much so. Very down to earth. Uh, very present. Like when you're talking to him, he's not all over the place. He like really looks looks at you when you're talking, you know, instead of like, yeah, 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 looking around. Very present. I remember when VH1 would do the behind the musics, and I saw, and what the week one was Hammer, and I had to watch how Hammer lost all his money because he's got all these guys on payroll and all this, well, uh, and I uh, felt oh, really gosh. bad. Now, the next week was Vanilla Ice, and I remember looking at my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, I was like, yeah. oh, God, I can't wait to see what one-bedroom apartment Ice is in nowadays. Oh, my right. God, dude. Mansion, 75 fucking motorcycles, 75 yeah. Rolls Royces. I'm like, wow, Vanilla Ice was smart with his money. <laughs> you, you know how much money that man made? He made serious cake. Oh, he said it was like it, millions a week. Yeah, a week. And you learn how to just, okay, I'm going to buy this. Um, you, who else would you say it? it Reminded me of something. Who else were you saying? Hammer. Um, oh, what I was going to say, you know how I met Hammer was really funny because I think school days had just come out and I was, uh, it was the first time I was, quote, like a, got invited to a, quote, celebrity basketball game or bowling or some kind of celebrity event. And this was a basketball game in um, Oakland. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Hammer's from. Now, Nobody knew who Hammer was. Nobody had ever heard of a Hammer, okay, at that point. So they're introducing different people from different other TV shows or movies, and the crowd was packed, this one gym. I mean, packed. Must have been 2,000 people there. And all of a sudden, you know, people, they, yay, you know, yay. And all of a sudden, they said, they're introducing the other team. And they introduced, yay, yay. And all of a sudden, and Hammer, the place, you would have thought it was like a, a Super Bowl in a Super Bowl arena. They went crazy, and we're all looking at each other, what the fuck is a hammer? Yeah. You know, and he came out from the edge of the court and danced with a 20 dancers behind him. You know, he's in the pants and everything, and, and just jamming, and we're like, and the, and the beat was hard. It was cold-blooded. I mean, he was, we were like, damn, who is that? And it was just... I forget what song it was, but it was like he was literally selling CDs after the game out of the trunk of his car. <laughs> and I got like 10, you know, and we all were getting because he was just, I mean, we'd never seen anybody like that in person. I mean, he did, literally danced around the, the gym floor while he was being, when he was introduced, like he was like the king of, of the, of the whole world. Everybody was like, I mean, everybody stood up. We were like, who the fuck is this? I mean, because nobody on our team, so-called celebrities, got it. You know, maybe one or two people went, yeah, I saw that commercial. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was, you know. And all of a sudden, MC Hammer. Yeah! I mean, the whole play. It scared us because we thought there was like a bomb went off. It was so loud. And then we, we looked at each other like, what the, and that was, like, what's Hammer? What, what? And all of a sudden, I think it was Let's Get It Started or one of those songs. It was just jamming and the bass was thumping. And all of a sudden, this guy comes jump, running out, uh, jamming, moving to every beat. Like, he moved to every damn beat of the song. I mean, usually dancing, you know, every other beat or every three yeah. or four. He was like, every beat he was doing a different move. And we were like, oh, what the hell is who? What is that? And then he was on the basketball team, on their team. So he was a really good athlete. But that's that's how I met Hammer. So have, we've been friends ever since. And that's how I was able to call him years later for the movie of the Reggie's Prayer. <laughs> I had five pairs of them pants. Oh. <laughs> it was the most comfortable was, things ever. You could wear them. You could exercise you. in them, sleep in them. You could shoplift in them. They were so baggy. They were the greatest <laughs> things yeah, ever. I think a lot of people did. <laughs> yeah. When, when they quit uh, making them pants, I got sad. <laughs> you know what's funny? 
he looks he looks bloated. I, I always wondered about that film. I always wondered. I wonder if anybody's ever seen it or has been released. I, I haven't been able to find anything about it. I've never even seen. I mean, I no, I've never. I read about it, and that was it. I've read about it for. I, you don't even read about it much anymore. It's been so long, but. Uh, yeah, cause I always like Vanilla Ice, and it was like, oh, he made a movie really cool, and you know, yeah, after like fifteen years, it's like this movie's not coming out. <laughs> well, I found out that a lot of movies are made that never uh, the studio would buy them. Sometimes they would buy your movie or your script, or they will buy your movie after you make the movie, and you think, okay, Warner Brothers or Paramount or Sony or whoever, they're gonna they bought my film. Well, they're not planning on putting it out. It was a little similar to one that they were already working on or thinking about, so they bought yours to take it off the market. Yeah, that's. I didn't realize how many movies are like. There's hundreds of movies with stars and people that will never see the light of day. They're in a, what they call the vault. They it ain't, it ain't. I'm like, there's so and so. Oh, there's so and so. Sherry Lansing, when she ran Paramount, took me to their vault and showed me all. I said, all these movies. She goes, they'll never be out. I said, you gotta be kidding me. That so and so is in there. That's so and so. Well, yeah, but they'll never be out. I was like, okay. <laughs> you know. Well, thank God, cool as ice came out because I haven't had the replica jacket from that movie back in the day. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> the one that said, that's... "Sex me up and down by law." And yeah, <laughs> I mean that's a hell of a good. That's a biker movie if I've ever seen one. Man. You know, somebody made money on that, okay? Somebody... Oh, they would have had to. It couldn't have cost but five bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I saw it in the theater, for God's sakes. It was a theatrical <laughs> release movie. God. Wow. Now, that one... Here's the weird thing. That one got a wide release where I am. So I had no problem seeing it with the six other people. New Jersey uh, City played in one theater here. And it played I was, in one theater... One exactly. Thing. In LA, it was in one theater in, in uh, Pasadena. <laughs> and, and, and let me tell you, I stuck out in that crowd considerably. <laughs> so when the guy next to me offered me a hit of his joint, I looked at him and, and I'm like, well, goddamn, I better say yes. So, I, and I did. And I remember the theater was just wafting of marijuana, but. Boy, after about ten minutes in, I I, I wasn't nervous anymore. I was, no. I was I was high as a kite. But yeah, I remember I remember was, I looked at, at my friend and I was like, we might not have wanted to come on a Saturday night. I said, I've got a feeling this could not end well. I knew nobody there. Like it it was in like here when they played any time like a movie like that came out, they would be like. There were two theaters that would show it. So, like, the West Roads would show New Jack City. Right. And then you'd go to the Indian Hills for, like, Juice. But you didn't want to go to that one because there legit would be a shooting on opening night. I know that because yeah. I was at a few yeah. shootings on opening night. So I went to the more calm of the theater where there usually might have just been one or two stabbings. Right. So it was a little bit safer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's funny. I, I was, I was, I remember leaving Juice because that's when they only played any, any movie like Juice Poison. They only played in one theater, and I remember leaving, and some guy was like, "I got the Juice now." Another guy pulled a gun on him and shot. I was like five people back. I'm like, I gotta quit going to these movies on opening night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you learn quickly. Yeah, because I'm a, I'm a painted target there, so to speak. You know, I'm. I'm hey, man. I, I, at least house party was friendly. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. The comedies, the comedies are usually pretty good. Yeah, the game I mean, movies, I got a lot of dirty looks at. <laughs> uh, they were just hot. You know what? Even if you hadn't taken any hit off of any joint, you would have gotten a contact high. Like you would have walked out of their highs a kind anyway. <laughs> well, the guy that looked at me, he his exact words is like, "You here to see Judd Nelson, aren't you?" I was like, <laughs> "No." <laughs> You said this ain't the Breakfast Club. Well, I was like, Sonny Spoon made this movie. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Not and you know, uh, Ice, you know, Ice Cube and I became friends uh, playing basketball. I met so many people playing basketball. and Playing the NBA. I helped start the NBA Entertainment Basketball League. Um, and I brought in a lot of my friends. I brought Dean Kane in. 
uh, to that. And he, you know, just basketball fans and that were it, not just celebrities, but you know, you had executives, attorneys, uh, assistants to people were got to play in the league. Uh, it was it was a fun league, and uh, we got to wear NBA uniforms, and NBA rookie refs, or the referees that were trying out for the NBA as refs were they would be our referees. Each game lasted one hour. They were always played on a Sunday. First game would start at like say ten o'clock to eleven, and they did a five minute. If it was a tie at the end of the game, did a five minute overtime. Um, and yeah, you know, it, it was just really run really well. Dean Kane's a great actor. He he never got the my opinion, but you know, I, I, if I was making a movie, I'd cast him. He never got the. The, the, the big leading breaks, uh, and you know, and I still to this day see him. I mean, when my son was younger, you know, when, the, when like the family straight to video movies would come out, Dean Kane would be in him, and it'd be like, my God, this guy has an age, you know. I mean, he's I know, a, I mean, I, good, a real good actor. Well, you know, his father is a really good director. Directs Chris Kane is his name. He's a great director. He does a lot of TV. I don't think many movies. He might do movies. He does movies, but I, you know, I think it's he's more known for television directing. Um, but yeah, he came up, and you know, of course, he went to s school with with Brooke Shields. They were engaged, you know, at, in college. Nice. Uh, he's an Ivy League guy, you know, so he's very intelligent. Had a tryout with the bull, with the uh, uh, not the Jets, but the um, it might have been New York Jets or Giants. He uh, he tried his defensive back. He he actually still has the. Interception record, I think, uh, where he played not Harvard, not Yale, but um, oh God, he's going to kill me if he ever hears this. I can't remember. Well, he yeah, doesn't, Brooks, anyway, Brooks he doesn't, was he doesn't know me, so he probably won't hear it. <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. I'm going to send it to him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cold. <laughs> that's cold. <laughs> no, he was, he was a good Superman. Yeah, he was. I know he's just a good. He's a student. He's a student of the business, so you know he can write, direct, produce. He can do all the whole nine. Um, it's you know I, I always tell people, you know, you can always get better, no matter what you do. And if you just think you've already arrived and you think you're the best, that's when you stop learning, man. You know. Yeah, I I tried to interview him once, but he's one of those guys that has a publicist that has. Like 175 other clients, so they don't even read the emails. Oh, uh, that's well, okay. One day, we'll, maybe we'll we'll call him on the phone and see if we can get him. We'll talk about Superman. Yeah. See what he thinks yeah, and, of uh, the new Superman, because I think he stinks. He, he he is a real good guy all the way around, man. All the way around. He was in those talking dog movies my son used to watch. Oh really? Yeah, they like family movies. The dog who there was like the dog who saved Halloween, the dog who saved Christmas. <laughs> he played the robber in every one that kept getting paroled to do more criminal, cr more crimes, but he always got thwarted by the dog. <laughs> it was him and Big Pussy from The Sopranos, uh, Vincent Pastore. Oh my God! <laughs> they were a great. Well, they were terrible criminals because they kept getting stumped by the dog. But I remember my son was like, "These guys are funny," and I was like. Well, that's big pussy, and he's like, "What?" And I was like, "No, forget I said that." And I was like, oh, shit, "That's Dean Kane." <laughs> big pussy is the oh. greatest name for a character in television that history. Is, that's right. a name right. and a half, right there. I'm, I'm, I might be doing uh, directing a project um, that is uh, about um, this guy named Cannonball that was uh, that uh, Babe Ruth kind of discovered from the the. The black uh, base, the Negro League baseball leagues at the turn of the century, and um, he could he could throw the ball. He called him Cannonball. He could throw a baseball so hard it went through a bale a uh, uh, bale of hay one time. Jesus! And uh, he struck out like three games in a row. Nobody could hit him. three games, like three games back to back. Nobody hit the ball. Somebody fouled one or two, and Babe Ruth fouled one off of Babe. He struck Babe Ruth out on. On um, I think nine on on nine pitches. Wow! And Babe Ruth said, "This guy, you got to see this." And he was nineteen. Uh, anyway, and I thought I, I called Dean. I said, "Dean, I need a letter of intent, man. I want you to play Babe Ruth in this movie." 
call, uh, about this guy, da, 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 and he goes, done. He sent me a letter. The attorney sent me a letter. So I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to make that movie. But Dean came to perfect Babe Ruth because Babe Ruth was very unique. He wasn't prejudiced like a lot of, of the blacks, like a lot of people were at that time. Mm -hmm. And he would, he started what they call barnstorming, where they would, you know, the, the major leagues wouldn't have blacks, obviously, in, in in their games. So what Babe would do, he would play him, and he would get a few other white players and play on Sundays at the black uh, stadium with the black players. And they would make more money because Babe was there, you know, uh, than they would. And, the, and the, you know, the people, uh, the, the commissioner of the baseball, the baseball league, the white league, uh, major league, they hated that, but they couldn't say nothing to Babe because he was the best player in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought that would be a good uh, story to tell. Oh, yeah, he'd be great at it. Hey, he looks kind of like Babe Ruth, don't you think? Yeah, he does. And he's a good actor. He can play the part. <laughs> he's a great actor. He's a great actor. So, I mean, that's what I love about this business. I've gotten to, to meet so many different types of people in all walks of life. You know? That's mm -hmm. such an education. Yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, you've worked with everybody. What uh, For all your fans out there, when can they... Is, can they find you online? Um... Do you have, like, a website or Twitter or anything like that? Uh, you know, I will pretty soon, but, uh, you know, I like just, you know, until I'm ready to put a film out, which is getting ready. To, I got a movie I'm directing, but I directed it. We just, we just won some film festivals. It's about, it's called Ball of Confusion. It's the history of basketball and its global impact on society. Mm -hmm. So not a lot of basketball playing, but it's a lot of people in there you'll know, like Rick. Barry, Michael Jordan, um, Oscar Robinson is my um, one of my business partners in this. Uh, Keith Zimmerman, he's in um, uh, Kansas City. He's the one that brought the project to me because he was marketing the hundredth anniversary of basketball. Uh, you know, while I was making White Men Can't Jump, and we met then, and he had all this old footage. You know, he had gotten with Naismith's family. Uh, James Naismith's grandson, the inventor of basketball, he was with him and Keith were marketing the rules, the original rules of basketball while I was making White Men Can't Jump. So we became friends then, and so we've been making this movie uh, documentary for probably 15 years now. And uh, it was my first film to direct, and um, we just we got accepted in a lot of these film festivals, so we're going to see what happens now. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a website you know, just for that. Uh, Ball of Confusion. I think it's already up. It's Ball of Confusion, uh, the movie. And people can uh, can go there. So, you know, and I'm, I'm just really enjoying my life. I'm here in Tennessee. I don't really enjoy living in L.A. anymore because, you know, I've already been there, you know. Yeah. Long time. <laughs> so, here I'm, you know, my mom is here. Uh, some people I grew up with are here. I'm, I'm on, um, you know, land where I get to see deer and rabbits and you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you know, instead of just hearing uh, cars and horns and stuff, I like that. I'd rather live in the peaceful area and go to the craziness as opposed to living in the craziness and try to find time to go to the peaceful part. Yeah. No, see. Plus, my mom can really cook. <laughs> <laughs> that beats L.A. any day. Oh, yeah. I always just go, to, I can come to L.A., you know, when I have to, or when I need to. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking your time to talk with us today. I hope you can come back one day. Well, maybe after the film is out, and hopefully it does some, does some noise, we can talk about about that one day. But I appreciate, appreciate you having me on the show, Corey. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to the Chronicles of Hollywood History. Thank you from Gomez Richmond Productions.